So this was a kid who was 17 years old living in Eureka, California during the Wild West, during the gun smoke, you know, post-Civil War era. So the United States Civil War ended, you know, 20 years before this book was begun, to put that in context. And this was a kid who was living with his family, claims in his preface that he began hearing voices while he was out near Mount Shasta with his family. And that one of these voices said, listen, I want you to tell my story from the year 11,160 BC, which again is a very, it's, it's a non-random date as we will later see. Um, and it falls right in that, you know, cataclysmic window that modern geologists believe ended, you know, beginning of the end of this ancient civilization. Welcome to the Spirit Box Podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits, and everything in between. Today, we welcome Michael Laflemme to discuss his book, Visions of Atlantis, Reclaiming Our Lost Legacy. Michael is a researcher, adjunct professor of history and philosophy, columnist for New Dawn magazine, a scuba diver, guitarist, and he grew up in South Florida where he attended Florida State University and studied Western intellectual history and U.S. foreign policy. And he's going to talk to us today on that most elusive and alluring of topics, Atlantis. So people the world over have grappled with the story of Atlantis for millennia. But how much is fact? How much is fiction? How much is something else filtered through the obscuring lens of time? Michael LaFlemme's work helps us clear that lens to get an interesting perspective on our would-be past. Using the clairvoyant impressions of Edgar Cayce, Frederick Oliver, Rudolf Steiner, Barbara Hanclough and others to supplement a concerted scientific, philosophical and historical investigation of humanity's antediluvian achievements and Atlantis's tragic demise. Through this work, readers will see just how the story of Atlantis has evolved from the seminal account passed down by Plato almost 2,400 years ago into those of the present day as we engage with some of its strongest proponents and harshest critics alike. More than just a dry catalogue of Atlantean footnotes, Visions of Atlantis strikes at the core of the great divide between materialist, reductionist and uh, the frontiers of metaphysics enjoining the readers to reconsider some of the most deeply held beliefs about ancient technology, psychic phenomena, reincarnation, the vast unknown past, and our uncertain future. It's a, it's a real treat. It's a real treat. And this topic and how our guest approaches it is, is absolutely at the nuxus of what this podcast is about and it's something I deeply deeply enjoyed those of you who know my photographic work will know that I've traveled to the Bosnian pyramids to Globeke Tepe to the plain of jars and I'm absolutely fascinated by our deep ancient history so this was a real treat for me and I think it's one you're going to enjoy we we really get into it here it's a it's a fantastic metaphysical and archaeological mix it's a wonderful show now in the plus show, we get into the Cuban anomaly, the Azores pyramid. You, you don't want to miss it. It's really interesting. Uh, we discuss the Bosnian pyramid, the mysteries of the polar regions. And we also get into kind of the nature of creativity and channeling and, 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 and writing, really, amongst other topics. Now, one thing I need to mention before we get into the show is my microphone um, was on the blink uh, when when we when we started recording, and despite trying to uh, tweak things, couldn't get it going. Um, so I appreciate Michael's patience while I tried to figure out what the hell was going on. But we didn't get there. So if I sound a bit tinny and a bit in the distance, that's what's going on. So yeah, my apologies, my apologies in advance. Not up to the usual spirit box standards. With that said, if you want to hear the plus show, and there's a whole other 45-50 minutes of the interview, 
then um, just click the links below and come and join the Patreon. You'll get a whole host of benefits, three years of back catalog of bonus shows, all the full plus shows amongst many, many other benefits and great, great content. Also access to our spirit garden work where we work on how we connect to the spirits and energies of place and um, simplify our lives, I think is, a, is one way of looking at it. If that sounds like something you like, then come and join the fam. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or any other video platform, then hit subscribe, hit that thumbs up, you know the drill. And I have one ask, if you don't want, if you don't want to do any of that stuff, if you don't want to do any of that stuff, then just give me a little five star rating. You know, be charitable. Throw, throw one out for a brother there. You know, you know the drill. Anyway, let's get on with the show. It is very, very um, lovely to welcome you to the Spirit Box. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. It was uh, great to have you here. And so to, to help orientate people um, <coughs> to, to understand where we're going to go today, could you tell them a bit about uh, your work and yourself? Yeah, well, um, I was a, a history professor for about 12 years. and you know, my history specialty subfields are not actually anything related to Atlantis, but, um, you know, I studied uh, Western intellectual history, uh, World War II, comparative ideologies was actually my specialty. And, um, you know, through teaching kind of survey courses over the years, sometimes you would run up against stories like Atlantis when you'd read Plato's dialogues like Timaeus and Critias, and I had always been interested in, you know, the works of Graham Hancock and Robert Boval and things like that. And I had a neighbor as a kid who had a bunch of Charles Berlitz Bermuda Triangle books and things like that that I thought were cool, but I never really paid it much attention. Um, this specific topic of Atlantis until about, I'd have to say, about eight nine years ago when. Um, you know, I read The Antediluvian World by Ignatius Donnelly. And, you know, that book is from 1882. But it's quite astounding, you know, what he said. And I really thought, you know, it's time for an update of that thesis with 140 more years of data points from, let's say, oceanography, archaeology, geology, things like this, but also. I had been reading some more uh, esoteric or clairvoyant based books or books on remote viewing as documented by U.S. military defense intelligence agencies, CIA, things like this. And what I really wanted to do was show people that, you know, clairvoyant archaeology or past life regressions or automatically written books, if juxtaposed against the quote-unquote hard sciences, um, it's quite astounding how much actually lines up. Um, often long after these readings or visions are given. Um, and, you know, it's easy to say in, let's say, the 20th century, the 80s, 90s, with, you know, I include a handful of channeled readings from those periods, but I wanted to go back to the original Atlantis channelings, which, you know, in my case would be the work of Frederick Oliver from 1886, where, I mean, he doesn't have the subconscious or conscious um, imagery of, say, science fiction, Star Wars, and yet he is describing that world from the reference point of the Wild West and a 17-year-old kid. And talking about geological changes that he could not be aware of, drawing sketches of ocean contour lines that he had no way to physically know. And yet, when you juxtapose them against modern bathythermic scans, for example, of the Azores, you see it's the exact outline. Um, and, you know, when people think that this is impossible, you know, I would really recommend another great book. Um, I think it's called The Secret Vaults of History from the 70s by a famous psychologist, I believe 
he became a psychologist. And, you know, it's a catalog of how people in the 20th century used clairvoyance to discover legitimate archaeological finds. Um, you know, and I really tried to bridge that gap, you know, because you really can't get a clear picture of this time period, which is, you know, according to my investigation, over 12,000 years, it's been since the fall, let's say the final destruction of the Atlantean empire. You can't get the clear picture, you know, as clear as Plato's picture is, it's still a very limited window. So you have to go into these more esoteric sources um, and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Don't take my word for it. Just look at the evidence. And, um, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to to do was was show people that this isn't just, you know, like my friend says, uh, I had a girlfriend with a past life in Atlantis or something who meditates with crystals and incense. This is actually... Uh, a subfield that has been documented and is just a form of mental faculty that's not easily reproducible and not easily accessible. And so the average person thinks it's woo or fake or something like that, but it's not, it's real. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the, the impetus for the book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, um, it's it's a really really engaging and uh, and and well structured read. I, I I deeply deeply enjoyed it. You know, um, and you do a fantastic job of building out that confluence point of of, of all these cross references. You know, you mm. build a center for it, um, and some of those. So, like, I mean, the reference point you gave there about uh, Francis Oliver and how he described the shape of the island, and then the kind of the the the, the deep sea image, you know, being being very yeah. particularly that kind of top line of of the island, you know, uh, yeah, you, you can see. And it. You, well, and you know, regarding that, um, I will never forget. You know, there were about three moments in the seven years of researching this book where I really became quite uncomfortable you know almost like people that are you know really seeing things on a ouija board or something yeah, yeah, yeah. when i saw that sketch which you know having read that book like five times a dollar on two planets he's got a couple sketches a couple weird things in there yeah. um and you know you just kind of take it okay there's a sketch of an island okay whatever but i was like wait a minute like what if, what if there is so let me bring out my bathythermic charts that I've been looking at. And I mean, I could not believe, Daryl, when I superimposed the 2020 satellite scan mm -hmm. over his sketch from 1886. And so I really started to think, because I did not go into this book trying to prove anything. I said, if the evidence is not there, it's not there. And then this book will become not a debunking book, but it will become a book about, hey, look, there actually is no evidence of what Edgar Cayce said you know, um, or Plato really was writing an allegorical myth, you know, but quite the contrary. Um, you know, I was shocked to find that, first of all, not only was Plato writing a historical account to the best of his knowledge and disclaims it multiple times that this is not a myth, um, contrary to what people believe, um, but that these sketches sometimes and these maps and these you know descriptions of you know this is what this region of the earth looked like twelve thousand years ago by people who were living before this was even common knowledge you're talking about people that were writing 140 100 years ago in edgar casey's case and yet somehow they knew things that were not discovered until the 20 the late 20th and early 21st century yeah um which to me is evidence, you know, however you want to categorize it is up to you. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's incredible. You know, I think it's incredible. And, um, you know, it really changed my views on the powers of the mind when applied and directed um, by an expert, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the nature of reality, you know, I, oh, yeah. it's a particular, uh, some fundamental <laughs> questions being raised there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but go, going back a bit, um, 
could you kind of give an overview for the listeners um, about Frederick Oliver and, and the book and talk okay. the world? When this was a new one for me, and kind of when I when I when I first heard you um, on um, on what podcast was it? Um, which, on Earth Ancients, um, which is that oh one? yes, great show, great show. When I first heard, it it, that's when I kind of I was like, oh, holy shit! Like uh, mm. I'd never heard of that, and it was kind of like, okay, this is Channel Paste, then there's Ed Casey, you know, and, and then there, there's yes, so the, like I said, that fantastic job of, of finding that point where all those narratives cross, right? Uh, and with the history, it was, um, was deeply intriguing. Anyway, I'll, I'll go over to you. Well, and you know, I'll say this actually because you just reminded me. Um, you know, it is interesting that. Well, let me let me explain it to you like this before I forget because I do want to answer your question. But it is interesting that the first channeled visions of this subject begin as the United States and Europe are arguably rediscovering their technological, high technological past. And again, the argument can be made that, well, they're just retrospectively projecting what's going on in their life over Plato's Bronze Age account. But actually, I would argue that, no, like this information was come out at this juncture because it would be able to be understood and applied, um, which is what Casey said. But in the case of Oliver, you know, this is a very weird book. This is one of the strangest. It became one of my favorite books, actually, but it's an incredibly hard book to recommend. You know, it's very, very strange um, book, but this is a, well, this is a text that became a book. So this was a kid who was 17 years old living in Eureka, California, during the Wild West, during the gun smoke, you know, post-Civil War era. So the United States Civil War ended, you know, 20 years before this book was begun, to put that in context. And this was a kid who was living with his family, who claims in his preface that he began hearing voices while he was out near Mount Shasta with his family. And that one of these voices said, listen, I want you to tell my story from the year 11,160 BC, which again is a very, it's, it's a non-random date, as we will later see. Um, and it falls right in that, you know, cataclysmic window that modern geologists believe ended, you know, beginning of the end of this ancient civilization. And the story begins really with this person, Philos, who is the voice, telling Oliver over a course of three years to tell the story of his past life as a character named Zame on the Isle of Poside, which was one of the parts of the Atlantean Empire in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and it's an incredible story. You know, I think I spent probably 40, 50 pages of the book explaining that and then juxtaposing all the things he says through this channeling with modern findings you know and some of it is so bizarre Dara that it's like I mean he said in 1886 he says I'm flying in my veil which is a cigar shaped flying craft that can travel underwater and through the air and we're flying over a part of the Amazon right now and little do you guys know, he's talking to his audience in 1886, who, by the way, doesn't exist because he never published this in his lifetime. It was published by his mother 40 years after, you know, it was penned almost. Um, and he said, look, many of these plants that you guys think in the 19th century are natural in this pristine wilderness are actually imported from Atlantis. And in fact, you might discover one day that the Amazon basin was crisscrossed by dikes, rivers, and actually had been farmed as early as 11,000 BC. And then the BBC in 2021 discovers that actually is true. And they put the date now at, well, actually, it looks like 
Plants had been imported to the Amazon as early as 10,000 BC, and we don't know where they came from. And again, that's just one little teaser of the dozen things he said that actually panned out to be true. His description of the inland sea that used to be near Arizona, where Lake Bonneville is now. Um, his description of a stone structure that's still there at the top of the Grand Tetons that he says used to be an observatory that you can go climb and see it now and nobody can explain it. What is a granite, weathered granite stone structure doing at the top of the Grand Tetons? Native Americans didn't use granite in their construction. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. And, you know, that story in a weird way it really helped the book bridge the the great divide that I was seeing because people frequently say, even people that believe, let's say, that Plato was telling a true account, they say, well, look, I can stomach Plato's account because he's just describing a Bronze Age civilization in a lost island with megalithic architecture and things. But there's nothing fancy about Plato's account of Atlanta. It's just a megalithic capital city with a moat and a temple of Poseidon that's, you know, ornate and decorated with orichalcum and tin and bronze, but it's, you could still wrap your mind around it. And he says that they sailed in triremes and fought with chariots, a bronze age description in Plato's dialogues. And people always say, well, how do you guys go from that to Star Wars Atlantis? That must be just people, you know, projecting their own times back. Sure. And that's why this book is so important, because the book, <laughs> this book was written in 1886, and he's describing basically Star Wars. He is describing the Star Wars franchise. And if Lucas and friends did not read this book, I'm shocked. I'm really shocked because he's describing I'm talking to a princess on my craft through a holographic projector, and she appears to me as a real person. Okay, there's the Sith, basically, he just calls them something else. There's the Jedi, he calls them the Sons of the Solitude. You know, he has a blaster rifle at one point that he calls an electronic rifle. You know, I mean, he's describing the Star Wars universe in many ways in 1886 with no reference points. And in his description, that technology by 11,000 BC had reached its apex but by 10,000 to 9,800 BC, the time Plato was writing about, had regressed to essentially the world Plato described. Because the leadership, he said, had divested themselves of materiality and basically gone, in his 1886 language, he said they became as electricity. So I don't know if they went into a computer or AI or whatever, and they just left people to their own devices. And most people didn't know how to continue the manufacturing the infrastructure because the leadership had checked out and gone to, I don't know, World Economic Forum headquarters in Atlantis or something. So that was a very important part because even I had that question like, okay, I take Plato's word, but it is weird because where is this high technology? It's not in Plato's account. Yeah. And then you find that Plato's telling a very small portion of the final century of Atlantis, which, according to Casey, had stretched for, you're talking over a period of 140 to 100 to, to up to 200,000 years in various iterations right. on a ever changing continent that's eventually whittled down to three islands by 10,000 BC. So, again, I always tell people like, it's not a good, really, question to say, like, we're, I'm looking for Atlantis. It's like saying I'm looking for the Roman Empire, and then you find ruins in Carthage. It's like, did you find Rome? No. You know, to, in, in my investigation, it, it really seems like because Casey talks about the three islands at the end, and he names them, you know, and one of the principal ones with the circular city is Poside. Oliver says Poseidon, and he has the circular city in his vision. And Plato has Atlantis with the capital city, but what's in the middle is the statue of Poseidon. So my argument is that Plato was really just talking about the Isle of Poseidon in the Atlantean 
empire, which he also discusses in his dialogue. He says it was a, I'm describing the capital city on a plain that had dominion over the surrounding islands and then dominion into the Mediterranean up as far as Egypt. And that you could pass to the whole continent on the other side. So Plato himself was aware of the Americas in 360, yeah. you know, which is, which is fascinating. Um, so there's a lot of things that you kind of have to unpack when you discuss this topic, um, because I think language, you know, just simply calling it a myth, it's like Plato literally says the beginning, this is not a fable or a myth. <laughs> this is a historically true account that's vouched for by Solon, the wisest of yep. the seven sages. Why would you need to disclaim that if it's a myth? You know? Yeah. So these are important things that I kind of, as I take people through the book, you know, just show them like, well, just read it a little more closely. And you might see that this isn't the Disney-fied, you know, version that we've inherited in the last, let's say, 30, 35 years when this subject became kind of silly. Fantastic. Um, I, you know, even, even if it wasn't, you know, even if that book wasn't hitting so many kind of points, you know, particularly now when you're, when you're kind of looking back from, um, you know, looking back from 2023 and you can see, uh, well, we, we've got a, a number of kind of, you know, bullseyes in, in terms of what the book was, was putting forward. Even if mm. that wasn't the case, it's still so visionary. It's it's astonishing. Oh, I mean, I, I even say, like, let's just pretend it's fiction. Yeah. How did he do it? Mm. How, how did he describe things that, I mean, he he has chapters in there where you think you're reading Nikola Tesla's diary or something. Yeah. His description of magnetism, for example, or the real function of the sun, or what gravity really is, yeah. or the science behind the technology he's describing. It's I mean, I've taught thousands of students. I've never met a student at 17 years old that could write like that that wasn't already getting an honorary doctorate in <laughs> physics from Cambridge or something. I mean... Yeah. And if you did do that as a prodigy or a secret contributor, you know, Tesla was secretly in his bedroom helping him write it. Why did you not publish it for yeah. 25, 30 years until, you know, after he died? Because yeah, yeah, these were just notes that he put in a drawer. And he even says in the preview, in the preface, he says, some of the things he told me to write, I wrote backwards. So I would write sentences out of order from the end of the sentence to the beginning. He says in other times, I would write one page and it would take me all day because the information was so difficult for me to process. Other times I'd write 60 pages in a day. Right. Um, and at one point he says, there's another thing he had me write that was so damaging if it were ever revealed a technology that he told me to throw it in the fire. So you can't read that part of the book, you know? So, I mean, and, and this was clearly disturbing the author, you know, Frederick Oliver, because he says that, like, I didn't feel comfortable talking about this, mm -hmm. but I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I finished the book and my parents were very creeped out by this, you know, like a Ouija board or something. Yeah. But um, there it is. There it is. The most detailed channeled account, I would argue of all time of what ground level life in high technology pulse side was really like down to how many semesters you have to go through in the university in the, uh, what do they call it? The show you know, in the show of semesters. show quith of semesters to reach, you know, graduation in pulse side. So a very strange book. Yeah, it's absolutely. Funny. Extraordinary. So, moving on to uh, um, a figure who's probably more familiar to the listeners, um, the great kind of Edgar Casey. Yeah. So, you you build out um, you, you you pluck out a lot of of accounts that he gave. Um, I think a lot, a lot of it was past life regression, um, and then some kind of direct questions about. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
Well, what would you like to know? There's a lot. Yeah, um, there there is. Yeah, um, I think I think I think building out kind of how the the, the readings from Edgar Casey helped um, <clears throat> kind of reinforce the premise of the book. Mm. It might be worth kind of giving a, a quick introduction to Edgar Casey uh, for those who aren't familiar with him. Yeah, sure. Well, Edgar Casey, you know, is the most documented probably in the world, clairvoyant, um, who, you know, around 1900 lost his voice from a rare case of meningitis, extreme case. And he cured it through hypnotism. He met a hypnotist at an opera house who cured it. And actually, well, he referred him to another hypnotist who ended up treating it fully. And that guy told Casey, hey, look, you have this, you went into hypnotic trance very quickly you should cultivate this skill. And in doing so, Casey realized that, you know, around the age of 27, 25, that he could remote diagnose illnesses, including he cured many members of his family first. Um, and he realized, like, as a Christian, hey, I want to help people. So slowly but surely, people started to send him letters. And, you know, I mean, he did 14,000 of these mm. hypnagogic trances. And during the course of, and had a 99%, by the way, accuracy and cure rate for all illnesses. Um, and I include some of his medical readings where he's speaking from trance and there's a doctor from Stanford by his side going like, how is this person saying these words? He doesn't have any recollection in waking life of these words. It's really astounding. That chapter of the book uh, is truly astounding to see how many people from Harvard, Stanford, Princeton came to debunk him and then left going like, I witnessed it. It's real. <laughs> he really did know where the third lumbar, you know, cervical lumbar was. And how did he know? It? And so, you know, he's credited as even by the modern American Medical Association as the father of holistic medicine, you know, because he understood that the body works as a system. And, you know, he was, of course, put in jail twice because of the Rockefeller American Medical Association agenda was coming out at that time in the 20s and the late teens where you couldn't practice holistic medicine without a license. It was banned. And um, but in the course of these readings, sometimes people would say, well, I want a past life reading. Can you give that? And he would. And, you know, he would take people back like five times five lifetimes, let's say. Sometimes it would go like Revolutionary War, uh, skip to Rome. Uh, hey, you saw Jesus on the hill. Uh, and then back and back and back until eventually you would reach Atlantis with many of his clients. And they would say, and this was in the 1920s. People were like, what? Atlantis? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? That's not real. And he... Over 500 different readings spread out over 20 years. You know, it's not like he was doing this full time, like Atlantis readings. These were just scattered over 20 years. And you've got to go through the archives and piece this 20 year story together. But it's astounding because it's he never makes a mistake. Like in the internal consistency of his story, if a client comes back 10 years later, he'll still give them the same name that they had from the past reading and the same date and this temple and this. And one guy noticed that he's like, I've sat through 600 readings and he never makes a mistake with the consistency of his past life readings. And it's, it's impossible to keep that much information in your head because he didn't even look at his past life readings. He would be in a hypnagogic trance on a couch a stenographer would be writing and he would wake up and say, what did I say? And then she would tell him and he'd file it in a cabinet or give it to the client. And that was it. So it's quite bizarre. And, you know, the Casey readings on Atlantis are important because he's one that, you know, pushes the timeline back. So again, I call it visions of Atlantis because it's like, it kind of is like, getting an eye exam, you know, like, which one is this clear? Is this, you know, and it's like, Plato's is a quite detailed vision, but it's very um, 
kind of, it's very, I'm not going to say bland, but it's, it's just kind of a bird's eye view of the city and a little bit of what these people did, but you don't really get a, like, what was that really like? And again, it's at a very, the final century, I would argue, you know, he, Plato's talking about the final iteration. And then Oliver is an incredibly detailed story that's still generally focused on 11,000 BC with a couple hundred years of little bit of history that he doesn't allude to. But Casey takes you back to 100,000 BC and what was going on. And he just, Casey details the three destructions, you know, the first being one of the strangest, really, which was Casey claims this guy came to him and said, I would like a past life reading. So, okay, great. Well, your name was Tim, T-I-M, and you presided over the great Congress. And the guy said, what? The great Congress? What are you talking about? He said, yes, the people of the world met in flying machines to determine how to deal with the animal menace that was overrunning the earth. The guy's like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, when was this? He said 50,722 BC. And the guy said, well, how did that have anything to do with Atlantis? And he said, well, at that point, it was a continent that stretched from basically Western Europe to the Gulf of Mexico. And again, when people say, well, that's impossible because there's an ocean. Well, go to my website, go to michaelleflam.com. Look at the top left picture. When you drain the water from the mid-Atlantic, what do you, from the Atlantic Ocean, what do you see? You see a giant continent that we call the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's enormous. It's bigger than the United States. So there's your former continent if people think it can't happen. Or it disappeared. It didn't disappear. It was changed, fractured, inundated. And Casey says, you know, through a misapplication of a directed energy weapon in 50,722 BC, which was pinged off the stratosphere, harp type technology, went into volcanic flows with the intention of destroying the food supply of the megafauna. Now, as fantastical as that sounds, you look in the Journal of Quaternary Studies, a mainstream peer-reviewed, you know, zoology or archaeology journal, depending on which chapter you're reading, and they have a megafaunal extinction spike at 50,000 BC that they cannot explain. And they say it's very strange because there's not supposed to be enough people, you know, in hunting bands to kill this many people, uh, these many animals. But we we attribute it to climate change, and probably hunting. Now, Casey said there was also a magnetic pole shift going on naturally at that time, but that this weapon exacerbated that and basically ushered in like a mini ice age that was even worse than the general ice age at 50,722, fractured the continent of Atlantis into five islands, which remained until 28,000 B.C., when they blew it up again through a misapplication of the Tuoi crystal, which was a supremely powerful technology that could be deployed similarly to, I mean, in the wrong hands, akin to a Death Star. In fact, he uses the word the death ray, and he says it could disintegrate. I mean, and he's saying this in 1932 before the atomic bomb was dropped, and he said it had the power to dis. He, it could harness the power of the sun to disintegrate the atom itself. He said that in 1932. He's an uneducated Sunday school teacher in a trance on a couch. Sorry. So that device, he claims it was an accident. And he says it was overtuned one day and it overloaded the substations on the main island and again fractured the remaining five into or destroyed two. And then there were three. And of those three, one was called Arion, one was called Og, one was called Poside, but they all still remain part of the Atlantean culture, which again was a multicultural empire. It was originally populated, Casey said, by Native Americans <clears throat> who became the Iroquois and the Cherokee. 
And, you know, it is interesting, uh, Dara, because there's a Native American myths. People don't seem to think, you know, that there's any connection. But the, Casey said specifically, the Iroquois are the direct descendants of Atlantis. He says, specifically said that. But there's a myth from the Ketua tribe in Oklahoma. And it's very interesting. Because I don't recall the Katua tribe having read Plato when they created this this uh, oral tradition, pre-Columbian oral tradition, where they say, we used to live far away in tall cities, and the people used their reproductive and technological powers for evil. And at one point, you know, we built a flying shield that could fly through the area with extreme, you know, speed that went and destroyed another city. And for this, we were punished. And it's like, you know, how many times do you hear Native American stories talking about they were talking about a Star Wars universe? You know, and that we had to take our white fire and preserve it and bring it to the new world, you know, Um and again, in Frederick Oliver's account, what's in the middle of the Incolathon pyramid, the unfed fire, the unfed flame, you know, which he says has the same basically focal point of the Ark of the Covenant, you know? And so it's a very interesting like continuity throughout Native American myths, you know, throughout Aztec myths, you know, the word Azteca. Means the people from Aztlan. Where's Aztlan? Sounds a lot like Atlan. You know? Why do the Greeks have a titan named Atlas that holds the world on his shoulders? The Aztecs have a god named Atlanteotl that holds the heavens on his shoulders. And in between them is the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's not that hard, folks. You know? <laughs> it's actually, it makes a lot more sense if you could navigate the Atlantic in remote antiquity without having to cross enormous stretches of ocean. In fact, the word Plato uses in the original Greek when he says at that time the Atlantic was navigable, what that word really means in ancient Greek was like easily traversable by foot, according to R. Cedric Leonard, not by ship. So this is important. Like Plato's even saying you could kind of skip across the archipelago way back and get to the other continent that, again, how does he know about Americas, the Americas in 360 BC? Well, probably because he gets the story from Egypt. And as people have discovered as early as, you know, I think the late early 90s, you've got substances from the Americas in mummies in Egypt. You've got cocaine, tobacco, marijuana, things like this. Things that are not indigenous to Egypt in mummies, particularly tobacco, you know, and the cocoa leaf, you know, marijuana, I would argue you could have gotten that from that region or in north of the Caucasus. I believe they have records of marijuana. People were growing weed all over the place, but the cocoa leaf, not so easy, you know. So, again, I think it's just as you piece the story together you've got to kind of quickly come to the realization that this this idea that we have been separated by this vast ocean the atlantic ocean again which for which there's no etymology or explanation etymologically for that word you know when it was much easier and and that the world has actually always been a globally a series of globally connected cultures that have risen to high technology and either destroyed themselves through wars, misapplications of technology, or just natural cataclysms, super volcanoes, comet strikes, perhaps, ice ages, et cetera, et cetera. I say again, I'm having trouble hearing you. Thank you for that. Uh, that was there we really go. Interesting. Um, I find that whole thing of. Um, <laughs> the vast chasms of time that we're going across here. And I think that's an important reflection for people, you know, to understand mm. that like what we're talking about is not a couple of thousand years. Like it's like, it's like a hundred of thousands of years for this yes. to hit this, this peak. 
you know, and, and you, 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 you put some evidence in, in the book there for kind of like uh, anatomically modern human beings, um, remains of, of such going back into the deep, deep, like antiquity. 300,000 years, um, according to anthropologists, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I always say, like, even if we just take the conservative date of like anthropological humans, modernly modern anthropological humans, conservatively, it's undeniable that for at least 200, a quarter of a million, like there were people that looked physiognomically like you or me of whatever skin color, hair texture, race, we don't know, a quarter of a million years ago with the same or greater brain capacity. So I always say, like, what did they do for the 195,000 years of the dead zone that mainstream history says nothing took place? When those same people, you know, went from horse and buggy 150 years ago to rockets that could land, you know? in 150 years now or even if you stretch it back to <clears throat> the, the cradle of civilization quote unquote let's just go back to 3000 bc fertile crescent or something like that okay well in 5000 years here we are in 2023 with the technology we're using right now from the dawn quote unquote of agriculture so if we could do that in 5000 years just to stretch it all the way out, why couldn't we do it in the intervening 195,000 years? And, you know, I think most people don't really look at it that way. That's why I put that chart in there from my friend Alexander Cheskovitz's book, because it's like, I think most people think like modern humans are only like 50,000 years old or 30,000 years old. It's like, no, they're 300,000 years old. Yeah. You know, like it's we've moved past like the quest for fire narrative where it's like we were living in caves and we had air all over our bodies like 6,000 years ago. It's like, no, we didn't. They were they found, you know, industrial mining complexes that are 50,000 years old. Those aren't quest for fire people using those. <laughs> That's a society that needs metallurgy you know, and a division of labor to have an industrial mine that UNESCO puts at 50,000 BC. And it's like, what's that all about? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Like, oh, well, according to Edgar Casey, there was a highly advanced society in certain parts of the world at 50,000 BC that had an empire that needed materials that would be going out and using these mines. Right. That actually makes perfect sense. You know, so I think it's like it's always been there. The technology and the ability to problem solve is like what makes us human. It's just that very little would remain except megalithic architecture and quote unquote myths <laughs> that we don't like to think are real, you know. But there you have it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it makes sense. I, I think there's there's a challenge for kind of for us moderns in in how we think like we tend to infantilize people from the past you know not even that far just in the past we tend to kind of think you know well sure, sure. as informed or as educated or knew as much as we did and right. in some instances that's true but you you strike a very important point which is not having access to certain technology or scientific understanding doesn't mean less intellectual capability you know right. uh, uh, equally you you look at some of the some of the construction from 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 you know from rome or egypt and not even not even that level of sophistication just look mm -hmm. at the megalithic tombs that we have in dubbed across northwest europe yeah I'd say there might be solar aligned or you know aligned with, with, with certain celestial bodies. Try right. that now. Try, yeah. You know, those of you who listen now, like, have a think about how would you build a you know celestially aligned structure now? Yeah. Now, most of us are useless now. 
You know what I mean? Right. 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 Exactly. And, you know, not only that, though, I mean, look at the I mean, look at the the big ones, you know, look at the Great Pyramid, which, again, Casey says was built by Ra and Hermes, a.k.a. Toth, in 10,490 B.C., before the final destruction of Atlantis and that it took 100 years and that levitation technology was used. This is what Edgar Cayce said in 1932. And then you find out 1980, 83, that that structure and the surrounding pyramids are aligned to Orion as it would have appeared in 10,450 BC. And it's like, that's a very good guess, Mr. Casey, or you're telling the truth through your channeling of the Akashic Records, which are basically just a, I mean, Casey calls it the skein of time, like S-K-E-I-N, like a thread, the yarn of time. And, you know, and Dolores Cannon and many of her regressions of her clients referred to the, this thread, like this grand tapestry that's like a ticker tape that contains all knowledge of basically all actions that have ever taken place on Earth. And then it's like an etheric cloud computer. Okay. Because the word Akasha in Sanskrit means ether, you know? So it's the ethernet. I mean, it's really like, we. what are we using right, right now? Like, I mean, really, like, these are important connections because it's like the Akashic records, that word came before and it means literally ether. And then we create wireless information networks and we call them what? We could have called them anything. Yeah. We call them the Ethernet. So it's like we're just recreating what naturally exists, I think. And so basically, Casey was just tapping into the real cloud through mental faculties, you yeah. know, however you want to define that or believe it or not. But he was doing something because he knew, <laughs> he somehow knew, he even knew that the shafts had a line to this star and that star and that the soul travels to that star. And it's like he was not an Egyptologist. This was a Sunday school teacher who, according to his family, had never read a book besides the newspaper and the Bible. That's it. Yeah. And he knows the shaft lengths and the distance of the descending gallery from his trance. But if you asked him in real life, where's the Giza Plateau? He wouldn't know in waking life. He'd say, I don't know. That's that thing in Egypt or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, again, these are very interesting things because in Casey's um you know, aftermath or right before the final destruction around 10,500 BC, you know, that's a big part of his story. In fact, most of his past life readings on Atlantis focus on that chapter, like the exodus from Atlantis and a reboot in Giza and the Yucatan and the Basque country because they know it's coming. And so the pyramid was built, according to Casey, as a final testament and record and prophecy in stone, if you can read it correctly, of the future, but also a device to reboot their technology and civilization and protect the ruling class who knew Atlantis was going to be destroyed. Um, which actually is what Arabic medieval records, which are the only records we have of the pyramid construction, which, you know thousands of years after it was built even according to mainstream bs khufu tomb time dating um which talk about that as that's why i call the chapter the final redoubt because there's like eight arabic legends quote unquote that people think are like aladdin's flying carpet that specifically say the king was told in a vision that the flood was coming and he built the pyramid and he stored within it all of his knowledge and it's like okay well, I'm pretty sure Casey had never read like Ibn al Nadim's untranslated Arabic text in Virginia Beach in 1932, which was not even available. But yet it corroborates medieval Arabic accounts, which again, we think we think are legends because that couldn't be because we decided in the 19th century that Khufu built it because a very suspect British explorer found a red 
ochre graffiti mark above the king's chamber that yeah. he could have written him his damn self. Yeah, it's like a crappy cartouche. It's not like it's, it's like really done. Right. And we go by that. Like, I mean, that's as stupid as finding graffiti on the Empire State Building from a gang in 5,000 years and saying like, oh, the this belonged to, like, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there's no record of the Empire State Building anywhere. But there's a gang graffiti on the side and there, that's that's who built it. They worshipped, yeah. you know, <laughs> whatever. So it's very funny that, you know, I, what this book really taught me was just how ignorant and arrogant our society really is when it comes to these topics, you know? That, that we really presume to know who these people were, what their real intentions were. And that's why I really took so long to write the book was because I never wanted to, you know, impose my beliefs on anybody. I just wanted to show you a bunch of new perspectives on this topic with the latest information and let you decide. But also show you how these gatekeepers basically have distorted this story. and obfuscated the story intentionally it's not accidental that they're doing this they really do not want this subject investigated seriously because they'd have to change their whole you know egyptology archaeology anthropology story and rewrite every world history textbook and they don't like that yeah well i imagine that there's a certain amount of like just being unable to accept that you know that as well uh, like that's a bitter pill to swallow, kind of everything you thought, literally taught to people, or everything you thought and believed is wrong. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a very humbling experience. I think a lot of people aren't kind of cope with that. Um, yeah. That's, that's the been, ego. It's been generous, you know. Um, now, you, you <clears throat> now, a bit in the book I found really interesting, because um, I'm literally back from my holidays in the Canaries. Um, oh. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. Um That's and actually cool. yeah, I went down to submarine. I went down to submarine um Really? Yeah, like what was it? Like yeah, I think it was like a hundred feet. We went down like in like a like lame kind of yellow literally look like, yellow submarine. <laughs> That's cool though. That's really cool. Wow. Yeah. Um but I, at the back of my mind there was kind of like oh we're in the Canaries. This is yeah. the areas. Um well. Um, and it's an extraordinary landscape, you know. Um, yeah, really remarkable volcanic landscape. Um, and I tried to find a little more about the, the kind of the, there wasn't much like available about the kind of the, the what they call the mm. Gauch, Gauch people. I can't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Right. Yeah, the Guanche. That's, That's it. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, yeah. The, the the Spanish made sure that there was nothing really to find out. Right. They yeah. wiped them out. Yeah. Yeah. Which seemed to be, you know, a remnant Cro-Magnon population. You know, it, it seems that the, the the Spaniards had run into a very anomalous population that, you know, because they didn't have boats when the Spanish got there. Meaning like they had been stranded in the cataclysm there for a long time because these were not seafaring people who settled there. You know, the Guanches, it seems like they, they just got stuck there, kind of like the people on Easter Island many have suggested got stuck there after the destruction of Lemuria, you know, yeah. um, that they didn't just move to this Island and start erecting these megalithic people. It's like, those were the mountains of a huge civilization. That's why the roads in Easter Island and some of these other places go into the ocean, you know, it's cause it's like, well, the ocean wasn't always that high. So yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, besides just Atlantis, um, it seems like there's evidence that the Phoenicians, you know, had already settled in the Canaries thousands of years ago and that they actually passed laws in North Africa, like preventing people because too many people were going there. They liked it so much and staying there in, T in Tenerife and all those things. So that's very cool, you know, and, and all of that area, you know, at the opening of Gibraltar and beyond from the Azores to the Canaries to Morocco to southern Spain, you know, it all has a kind of part to play in this um this atlantis saga you know down to things that 
many people might not even think about, like Cadiz, Spain. You know, it used to be called Goddess Spain, and Goddess, according to Plato, was one of the kings of Atlantis who had dominion over southern Spain. You know, and it's like Cadiz is the oldest city in Western Europe. It's like 1300 BC or something founded by the Phoenicians, you know, and then in Morocco, you have some anomalous things, um, you know, the Berber language, some of the Berber myths mention Atlantis, the Romans used to refer to the people of North Africa as the Atlantis, you know, so it's interesting, you know, and I try to really kind of take people on a world tour, you know, like through time from pre-Platonic sources to the present, but also a tour. Like, let's look at the evidence in Spain, North Africa, the Azores, the Canaries, North America, South America, Central America, and beyond, you know? And let's see how this civilization with a nucleus in the mid-Atlantic that projected power on both sides, I would argue, let's see what they left. You know, and let's see how that makes more sense than this idea of it's just pure statistical coincidence that the Basque language has similarities to the Nahua and Yucatec languages, which is so bizarre that, that really there's no explanation for it unless. Yeah, that stuff's extraordinary. It had an original etymology as the Atlantean Paleo Sanskrit, probably, language that was probably one of the original languages of the world yeah you know so and frederick oliver even draws what it looked like he draws the script this is how we use the write with these weird paleo sanskrit symbols um so it's interesting you know like how did a 17 year old kid you know know about paleo sanskrit and basque and you know even the characters from his quote unquote fictional story have names that sound more like Basque or Nahua names. You know, Princess Lalix, his friend Zayim, Manin, Anzime. They sound similar to modern Basque names that I looked up in the Basque phone book. You know what I mean? So it's just interesting when yeah. you really zone in and, and pick it apart like an investigator. You know what I mean? And it's a hugely an anomalous part of the world. You know, mm -hmm. don't really know where the Basque people came from. No. The Center from Basque Studies themselves say there is no explanation. Yeah. And a fantastical explanation is that they're the survivors of Atlantis. You know, that's their official website says that. It's okay. like, well, that is fantastical, isn't it? Yeah. Or it's true. Yeah. You know, and, and why did Edgar Casey say that? Mm -hmm. Why did he specifically say? One of the main places they went, besides Yucatan and Egypt, was the Pyrenees Mountains. Well, that's exactly where the Basque language originated. And again, Edgar Casey did not study ling languages. He didn't know about the Basque language. You know, very few people today know about the Basque language. You know, Euskara. So it's like, it's not an Indo-European language. It has no connection with any other language in Europe, but somehow if you put a Basque person with a person in an indigenous village in Yucatan, more often than not, they can understand each other. And it's like, how is that the case? Like, where did that come from? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, perhaps Edgar Casey was telling the truth that these are remnant populations from 10,500 years prior to you know our timeline that over time became distinct cultures because they could no longer communicate because they had lost contact with each other and were remnant mm -hmm. migrant evacuees from atlantis that actually makes perfect sense yeah for those uh for those people listening and they want to find out more about you about your work where's the best place for them to do so yeah, well, you can get the book on Amazon. Uh, just type in Visions of Atlantis, Michael Leflem. Or you could go to my website, uh, Michael Leflem, one word, my last name combined, dot com. 
And I got some great resources on that site as well, like uh, scanned copies of public uh, domain 19th century books on Atlantis, including A Dweller on Two Planets that you could read. And um, some links to a lot of other researchers that I really appreciate and used, as well as a link to uh, my Patreon and my book. So yeah, you could find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and actually uh, Blackwell's in England now carries it. <laughs> cool. Awesome. <laughs> Which I've never been to, but apparently I saw it on the Blackwell's shelf online. So I thought I might as well, since we're in England here, oh, yeah. shout out Blackwell's. And actually, it will be physically in the Atlantis bookstore in London next week. They right. asked me for a copy, Good. which is very cool. Yeah, the, the oldest occult shop in, in, in London. That's right. That's right. So I figured I got to get them one. Come on now. The Atlantis bookshop. Uh, definitely. So there you go. Congratulations, Mike. Michael. Michael, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, um. When uh, when your pirate stuff is 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 done, come back and tell us tell us. Yeah, about it. absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's that's really been such an exciting project to research. So I I'm really excited to to get started on that and chill out on Atlantis for a while. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Dara. I really appreciate it. And again, um, you can find it on Amazon.com, MichaelLeFlam.com, and audio version as well is available in case you like to listen to it great stuff well i'll make sure all the links to the uh, appropriate areas are in the show notes all right well thank you so much Brilliant. and i'll talk to you soon thanks for coming on the spirit box absolutely bye bye Thank you, Michael. What a fantastic, fascinating conversation. I hope you all enjoyed that. If you want to find out more, then do check the links in the show notes. It's to all the different um, areas where Michael's work can be found and indeed links to some of the um, publications that we discussed in the um, in the show. So check those out and uh, do give Michael a follow and pick up his book. It's good to support this kind of independent research. Right, that's it from me. I'm Dara Mason. You've been listening to The Spirit Box. Thank you and take care. Bye.